Good morning. The class of 1969 welcomes you to our 50th reunion conversation. We're looking to engage, we're looking to share with you and then to engage with you in reflections, in reminisces, in ideas. We're delighted that you're here for our conversation about point of departure. I am Bob Candell, and joining me today are Lloyd Constantine and Larry McCullough, my classmates. First, let me ask everyone to just spend a moment. Maybe you want to close your eyes and just think about how you come into Williamstown, how you come into Williams College. Do you make that left-hand turn off of 43 onto 7? Do you come over Petersburg Pass, getting on to 2 and 7, come from Bennington or from the east on the hairpin? And what's your favorite landmark on campus that tells you you're here, that tells you that you're home? OK. Let me continue to keep you at ease by telling you, first off, that if you've not read the two books that are on the agenda, <laughs> Science and Human Values by Jacob Bronowski and The Image by Kenneth Boulding, don't worry, you can still enjoy the program. There will be no blue book. <laughs> My recollection of our, fifth, of our fifth reunion is that it was fun. We were fresh out of college, we were in grad school, we were doing things or trying to figure out what to do. It was good to see people after five years. Our 25th reunion, my recollection is that, that the word that expresses that reunion best is ambition. And I don't mean ambition in a negative sense, but we were putting our lives together, we were building our families, we were working hard towards whatever it was that we were working. The 50th reunion, however, we all know, is different. It is both unique and poignant. It is a time for reflection, reflection about the past. This afternoon, our class is going on a memorial walk, looking at points on the campus that will draw memories of our colleagues who are no longer here. And it's also about the future, as we turn 71, 72, 73. In June of 1969, for us, 50 years was an abstraction. Yet the week after our graduation, the class of 1919 was hosting its 50th reunion right here. Members of that class may have fought in the Great War. Some may have died in it. On that day, those who attended that reunion, they knew what 50 years meant. At our 25th reunion, the class of 1944, celebrated its 50th reunion, coincident with the 50th anniversary of D-Day. That class knew what 50 years meant, and we were starting to get an inkling. This year, this week, however, it's our turn. We understand what 50 years means as we look back and as we look forward. Actually, we should be celebrating, I think, 54 years, because it was 54 years ago that we arrived on the campus for freshman days. And it is what occurred in those first four years that truly warrants celebration. Robert Frost lived in North Bennington, just up the road. He died there, and he's buried there. Sometimes when I was going to uh, Bennington, I'd stop in that North Bennington area and uh, by the green and go over to the cemetery and look at his, stand and look at his grave. And I recall him because he gave a poem, he read a poem at John Kennedy's inauguration when we were 13, the, gi the, the gift outright. And the poem begins, the land was ours before we were the lands. The land was ours before we were the lands. I'm gonna change that a touch for today. Williams was ours before we were Williams. Williams was ours before we were Williams. What do I mean? Our becoming Williams was a process. The process by which it started, by which we started, 
to acquire the intellectual, social, emotional skills and tools, and also by which we started to acquire a sense of personal confidence, a sense of confidence that we could take on things which we might not understand, but be able to figure them out and at least try to make a suggestion as to how they could be solved. And that started, I believe, when we arrived here. And it became the foundation for a lifelong process of continuous learning. In 1964, getting into college was not as crazy as it is for our children or our grandchildren. Then some 2,000 guys, and it was all guys, um, applied. The following spring, the college mailed out 500 acceptances. And some 300 of us accepted those acceptances. The college was ours at that time, but we were not yet the college's. What happened? What happened next? In August, I'm assuming it's August, the college sent us Bernowski's book, Science and Human Values, and Boulding's book, The Image. They told us, read the book and be ready to discuss them when we arrive for freshman days that September. Most of us, I'm going to hypothesize here, uh, thought, thought when the books arrive, this is no big deal. Science and Human Values is less than 100 pages. I can, I can knock that off no sweat. Um, but I bet that most of us, I know there's, you know, embarrassed laughter, but I bet most of us read those books because back then, in 1964 and 1965, we followed the rules. The rules were important in our lives at that time. I suspect there was a box on the admissions form, does the kid follow the rules? And if it was checked, you had a chance to get in. <laughs> I don't know if they would say that when we left, but then it was different. Um, and then we started to read the books. Most of us had never heard of Bronowski, Bolding, their books. These were intellectual authors written, writing intellectual books for other intellectuals to read. And I don't think we thought of ourselves as being intellectuals. I, I didn't at that time. They were challenging to read and challenging, even more challenging, to understand. By asking us to read those books, however, the college was putting us on notice that we were at a point of departure, that it had serious expectations of us, and that it expected us to meet those expectations. The iconic Williams image has Mark Hopkins sitting on one end of the log and a student on the other. Did you ever wonder what Mark said to that student? I think I know what he said, by analogy, because in March of 1965, I'd been accepted by the college, but I hadn't yet accepted the college, and I came up for a weekend. And back in those days, you will recall, Saturday, Saturday morning classes were the rule. And so I went with Bruce Thal from 68 to a political science class, which met in Mather House. And coincidentally, Mather House was right here, right on this site at that time. And it was an old, probably a 19th century, mid 19th century frame house building. The class was in the dining room, which was in the front. And it was around the dining room table. And there must have been 10, 12 guys. And at the front of the room was the professor. The professor was very intense. The professor was Bob Gaudino. And, and when everyone had gathered and there was quiet in the room, he looked up and he said, Mr. Thal, what do you think about? Dot, 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 dot. And that went on for the next 90 minutes. But I said, wait a minute, to myself, what's going on here? I'd never heard a student called Mr. And then to have that followed by, what do you think? I mean, where was I going? You know, this was, there, there was something going on here which was only an inkling of what was to be coming. And um, <clears throat> what I want to say really is that uh, it's an example 
of the exposure to the idea that Williams expected us, challenged us to engage with deep and subtle writings, with deep and subtle themes, themes of creativity, of, of uh, truth, of learning, of you know, what's purpose, what's meaning. You know, yes, we studied topical subjects, but buried in all of that were these basic fundamental questions. And we were being asked to be able to train ourselves to discuss, to, to, to read, to think about, to analyze, to discuss complex ideas with professors, and more importantly, to discuss with each other these ideas, these, these, com these complex ideas. Now, at Williams, at, as Williams students, the college expected us to, they didn't expect, they demanded that we develop critical skills of observation, analysis, computation, writing, public speaking, in order to be able to do our work here and to do our work in the larger community, in, in the world in which we would be go to which we would be going. And we've talked the last day about that world was not a simple world. We had tremendous, tremendous social, political change going on. And I'm not gonna detail the, but the, obviously there's the civil rights issues, there was poverty, there was the war in Vietnam, there was tremendous changes going on on this campus. But we were here to acquire skills that would help us through this campus and beyond. And one of the most important skills that I felt I acquired, and I believe Many of us share this. We acquired a sense of confidence, a sense that we had developed abilities and capacities to address problems, to express ourselves, to change our minds, to grow, of enormous, enormous importance. Um, to carry this theme just a bit more, you know, those of us who took history, 101 or 103, went through the, um, one of the early exercises was the massacre of Glencoe. Now, you don't remember the massacre of Glencoe, so I'll tell you in a sentence or two what it was, because I don't remember it. It occurred in the late 1600s in the Jacobite uprising in Scotland. And on one side, you had clans with William III. On the other side, you had clans affiliated with King James. And somewhere along the way, 30 members of the Clan MacDonald were massacred, cold blood. The assignment is, what happened? You tell, you tell the professor. We were rookies, so what did we do? We, got, we were given a packet of materials. We were given source materials. We were given letters. We were given military orders. We were given you know, transcripts of courts of inquiry and all that other stuff and go figure it out. We had, well, at least I had been mostly reading stuff in a history book written by someone else, a secondary source, if not a third tertiary source. That was the assignment. But that basic format of assignment, I believe, permeated the curriculum from that point on with one difference. After that time, no professor gave me a packet of materials and say, here it is. You had to go over to Stetson, or you had to go to the laboratory, or you had to go to the computer lab and get your own data and figure it out. And, you, and we had to work hard to figure it out, and you, we got better at it. Um, along the way, and this is really, I think, critically important to my feelings for the college, my feelings for you is that along the way, on a small campus, and people who are here with a campus with a class of 500 really can't appreciate what it means to be on a campus of less than 300 students in your class. I got to know you, you got to know me, not necessarily intimately in every case, but we knew each other. And from each other, we were able to learn. We were able to test ideas. They may be the ideas in the class, or they may be the ideas of the current political situation, or working for McCarthy, or doing whatever we were doing. And that was an incredibly important part of being here. And it's still an important part 
of being here, and it's one of the factors that brings me back on events like this. Um, <clears throat> graduation, 50 years ago, this weekend, 75 years after D-Day, brings, brings over 100 of us back together again, which is wonderful. It's wonderful because we can appreciate each other, we can appreciate the college, and what, and by the college I don't mean, uh, I mean the people, the professors, the coaches, the staff with whom we engaged over those years that we were here, that we can appreciate them and appreciate what they enabled us to accomplish as we built our lives. And yesterday we heard from 11 of us and people went in all different directions, and they're still going in different directions, but they're all going with the skills and the training that we got, of which we were given notice when those two books arrived in our inbox. Um, my, at the moment, or not the this weekend, the overwhelming feeling that I have is one of gratitude. Gratitude to my parents, for making it possible for me to come here. Gratitude for Ephraim Williams, a soldier whose generosity laid the foundation for this school. Gratitude for Jack Sawyer, who was a, a incredibly, he created changes as we were here. The changes were occurring around us to create the Williams that we look at today. And I think he was a wonderful, wonderful leader for this school, and we were lucky that he was here more, no, we were lucky that we were here when he was here. Um, also, of course, the faculty, and each of us has particular faculty members that we hold dear, and those are important memories for each of us because we know how they help us address problems then or lay the foundation for us going forward. And um, I'll, again, I'll close by, by saying my gratitude to my fellow classmates and your contributions to my education, to my ability to develop confidence, my ability to build a career, because I think all of us have benefited by being together. And I think we benefit by being together again at this time, because we're at another point of departure. Many of us are changing our uh, careers, we're winding down, some of us are continuing, some are going into new areas, but there's still the opportunity to continue to be involved, to make a contribution, to address, to have agency and address the problems that, and the opportunities that are presented by our families, by our communities, and most importantly at this time, our country. So I think we, we can all share the, the uh, contribution that we've made to each other and the contribution that the larger co college institution has enabled us to, to build upon. Uh, I thank you, and I'm now going to ask Larry, no, Lloyd? Larry. Larry, come on up. Uh, so that's who official I am in one capacity. I, have spent four, I spent 40 years full-time as a medical educator, trained as an academic philosopher, so I was a philosopher among physicians and medical students. What I did was being invented the summer after we graduated by a philosopher named Dan Clauser, who was hired onto the faculty that was then the brand new medical school at Penn State uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, a magnificent scholar and brilliant, brilliant teacher uh, who, was, who was one of my role models, as were many faculty um, here. And thank you, Bob, for inviting me to be part of this. It's really um, a great pleasure. My memory of the session where we discussed these books, it, it was in the pink building called Jessup Hall. Am I right about that? And the other memory I have is I'm almost certain that one of the panelists was Jack Jacobs. Do others remember that? Fletcher, you remember that? Is that correct? And I remember two things about Jack and Fletcher and the, and the other few Texans, Kevin Fry in our class, was that I thought these were the most exotically plumed birds I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> Uh, and they all had accents. And by January of 1971, I was in Austin, Texas in graduate school, and I was the one 
uh, with an accent, according to the very nice cashier at Sears, um, who checked, out, checked me out with all the materials I needed to set up uh, my little apartment to go off and be a graduate student. So I'm very grateful to, to the people of Texas to supporting that. By the way, in honor of that, I'm wearing my burnt orange and white UT shoes. <laughs> we, are known as, we are known as tea sippers. Um, so first thing I want to remember with you is that in, at the end of winter study in 1969, I trod the predecessor of these boards as the boy's father, Huckleby, in the Fantastics, an all-student production produced and directed by uh, Dan Boone. Fred Bashir was our music director. The music in the Fantastics sounds simple. It is really hard. Um, close harmonies that are unusually really, you have to literally memorize every note and look at, you have to be able to see the, the notes going by as you're, you're singing up here. Um, about a week after the performance, uh, Professor Beals, who was one of my philosophy professors, stopped me on campus and warmly congratulated me on my performance and everyone else. Uh, and he said two things. He said, Larry, I could tell it was you because you were the taller of the two fathers, which I thought was a nice compliment. And then he said, when you called your son an ass, you said that with such relish. And the line is, son, you are an ass. To which the son says, I beg your pardon. And the father says, I say that you are an ass. And he said, how did you do that? I said, well, I heard it so often growing up. All I did was replicate it. <laughs> By the way, The Fantastics was written by Harvey Jones and Tom Schmidt, two graduates of the University of Texas uh, at Austin. So it was from The Fantastics that I wound up in Austin in graduate school. Now, as a medical educator, I have to summarize the reading. So here we go. Uh, and these are direct quotes. Now, you're not supposed to read slides unless they're direct quotes, according to trained educationalists. So here's, what, here's the essence, I think, of the book. So science takes its coherence, its intellectual and imaginative strength together from the concepts at which its laws cross like knots in a mesh. Notice the book is full of metaphors, which all of science is, we forget that. And whether we look at facts, at things, or at concepts, that's for the philosophers, we cannot disengage truth from meaning that is from an inner order. We now understand that science is built not on facts, but on observations. This is really important. This is prescient in terms of philosophy of science. That observation is not a passive state of reception, but an active relation between the observer and his world, now we would say his or her world, and that science is therefore not a mechanical index of facts, but an evolving activity. Just, a, I read this and I said, this is amazing, this is exactly right, uh, 50 years or 60 years after the book was written. So what's my take? In science, what you do is create concepts that link observations that are not previously linked. By the way, this is how you make a medical diagnosis, and testing the reliability of the proposed link in evidence-based reasoning creating the inner order of nature. You don't discover it, you make it, uh, and it's gonna be durable or not. And then when evidence-based reliability is established, the link becomes causal, a pattern with scientific meaning. So about 20 years ago, I was serving on a, what's called a data and safety monitoring board for a huge hypertension prevention trial at the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, where we monitored the, the science, the clinical uh, practice, the safety, and the ethics of the trial. And at lunch one afternoon, one, during one of these meetings, I forget her name now, a very distinguished cardiologist from UT Southwestern in Dallas, the second best medical school in Texas, um, remarked to her colleagues that if you looked at coronary artery disease, that is the placking of the arteries, from an epidemiological point of view, it looks like an infectious disease. The other cardiologist said, that can't be right. Well, she was right, because it's now thought that one of the mechanisms that causes that disease is secondary inflammation subsequent to a viral infection. So, but she, right, she made that connection, but it took many years for others to gather the evidence to establish that indeed there was a causal connection. Now, what do those of us in the humanities do? Recreate concepts that link observations not previously linked and explore the reliability through disciplined reflection of just the kind that Bob was describing. That's what we were taught to do here. This is serious stuff and you just can't think anything you want. Mr. O'Connor made that very clear in Philosophy 101. Um, so when disciplined reflection is accomplished, the link becomes an interpretation, not a causal explanation, but an interpretation, a pattern with aesthetic, anthropological, ethical, historical, narrative, philosophical, religious, or sociological meaning, and I've, I've left out a discipline, please forgive me. So to explore meaning is to make connections, and to make connections become a weaver. And as I thought back, I think that's what at least I was taught to do here. Think of the distribution requirements. They were there to make you think about how do you connect the humanities, the social sciences, 
and what used to be known as the natural sciences. So you weave, and you weave by connecting to the past. Um, it took me a long time to realize that in Philosophy 101, 102 with Mr. O'Connor, um, we never read a work of a living philosopher. And he was sending us a message, just because you're alive and they're dead doesn't make you smarter. And I learned from that. When I face a philosophical challenge, I say, somebody has already thought about this way better than we can think about it. Find out who that person is and then bring them into our context. And so you connect to the past. And in honor of my wife, Linda Quintanilla, who's sitting right here, she's an historian, has this wonderful t-shirt. I'd find you more interesting if you were dead, right? <laughs> You make meaning by connecting to the past, which, by the way, there's truth in that. And one of my beloved professors in graduate school, Chet Lieb, who hooded me at graduation in 1976, was a very special honor in the PhD world, uh, Chet taught us that none of us is wholly present, each of us is partially past. And so I took that forward with me. So some cases I encountered as an ethicist in a medical school. The first was there's a tradition in medical schools that you go to the courses of other professors when their material is going to influence what you teach. So the introduction to patient course at Texas A&M, which opened in the fall of 1977, the very first class was taught by Harry Lipscomb, a brilliant, brilliant internal medicine doctor who was our personal physician as well. Um, and he presented a young man who was 20 years old. He was, a, I think, a third year student at the university and asked him to take off his shirt and began a physical examination. And he looked like this. This is the Apollo Belvedere. Um, and I have this down here. It's a Roman copy of a lost bronze from 350 to 325 before the Common Era by the Greek sculptor Leocaris, Leoc I guess is how you'd say it. And this is a Roman copy dating from the second uh, century uh, in the Roman Empire. From, he, didn't ha he had him stripped to the waist, but from the waist up, he looked just like the Apollo Belvedere. And I'm sitting there saying, what's going on? This kid had insulin-dependent diabetes. And so what Harvey was saying was, right, so I connected this. So I thought to me, here's something to think about. Imagine the Apollo Belvedere with insulin-dependent diabetes. We'd start looking at great works of art and say, gee, what if they're sick? How do we tell that? How do we? So that was one connection I made. Now we go back 10 years ago. I think, speaking of images, this is a magnetic resonance image of a 23-week fetus rotated 180 degrees so that you can see it easier. And it's what's called a sagittal view. That is, the cuts are coming in from the side. And this is the cut that you would have through me or through the fetus, head to toe. Now, you can see the fetus and then what's called a tumor. This is a teratoma, right? And it's, a, it's an abnormal growth. It was coming off the, the, the tail. So it's a sacrococcygeal teratoma. And these, uh, these are, this was highly vascularized. So this, at 23 weeks, this fetus's heart was failing, was going to die in about 10 days in utero unless something was done. Um, but teratoma is a nice, innocent-sounding word. It comes from teratos in the Greek, which means monster, right? And they're called monstrous growth because you can find teeth in them, hair, eyes, partial organs. And, and, so, and we, people saw these when these babies would be expelled. Um, that's what they thought. Now, what's a monster? It's a sign or portent sent from the gods to punish transgression against their will. Now, it's a very interesting concept, because if you sin against the deity or deities, you know what to do. Go get shriven. Get right with the gods, and everything will be OK again. You can make sense of it. Not now. The scientific explanation of this event was an accident of human reproduction, which has no human scale. Right? There's no way to find solace in this. This fetus underwent uh, surgery. They opened up the uterus, opened up the pull that got the babies, and now this is a technical surgical term, pronounced in Texan, it's called a butt, B-U-T-T, butt. <laughs> um, and they cut the teratoma off, sewed the baby back up, put him back in. The best reported, there were about 11 reported previous cases, eight survivors, three deaths. Um, the most, the longest survivor was three weeks, which is a, gives the heart a chance to remodel. This fetus survived in utero for 10 weeks. That's because the surgical team at Texas Children's Hospital is the best. Who disagrees with that? Right? But with the things, you think we use these words. The baby was born, and she went, she went fine. She had some cosmetic surgery to work on the scar, and she's now 10 or 11 years old and doing just fine. Um, an amazing story. 
her, her parents ran a small Baptist church down in the Texas Valley. And when, they found, when her, his congregation found out that they had to come up to Houston for all of this, um, one of his congregants said, well, I know someone in Houston who probably can lend you their condominium because they're away right now. It turned out to be the condominium, a condominium in the most expensive condominium building in Houston. And the father would describe how he would get up in his beat up old family van, have, have it pulled up for him next to all the Mercedes and Ferraris and everything else. And by the way, the whole building adopted that family. They didn't have to cook a single meal for 10 weeks. They were just taken care of. And that's in the best tradition of Texans taking care of each other. By the way, they take care of Yankees too, like, like me. The next thing I was on is I was on the gender medicine team at Texas Children's Hospital. This is where we help to think through how you assign a, a sex, not a gender, uh, to a child who has what's now called a disorder of, disorders of sexual development, where the external genitalia don't look normal or they don't match up with the internal genitalia. And we, can, we had to come up with a way to understand this. And what I learned scientifically is there's no, no such thing as two sexes. Um, it's highly variable, even at the chromosomal and genomic uh, level. And so intersex is not the right word. And it was called a disorder of sexual development you use that language so that insurance companies will pay. It's not a negative term at all. It's a very positive term. It also means we don't quite understand all the causal pathways. Well, this, I thought I would include this topic because here we are, April 9th of this year. Kazimir Pulaski, Polish hero of the Revolutionary War, was most likely intersex. And this resonated with me immediately because my last two years of high school and first two years here, we lived in Buffalo and there was the Pulaski Parade in South Buffalo. Um, which my classmates in high school all required that I go to, which was great fun together. Um, so, and this is the picture that they had included, noting that he had a f an effeminate chin, but a mustache, right? So you have these mixed characteristics of male um, and female. And how do you make sense of this? Because we all think dimorphically or binary about sex and gender. And it turns out that thinking just has to be abandoned. And we had to help parents come to terms with that because some of these conditions you can predict pretty confidently how the, the kid's going to come out in terms of self-identified gender, especially in terms of how the brain is sexed, um, but sometimes you can't. And so you have to prepare them to live with the fluidity of the sex and gender of their child. And the leader of that team, Lefkothea Karavidi, a brilliant, brilliant pediatric endocrinologist, also from Greece, as you can tell by her name, she led a paper we did on the concept of fluidity in these disorders, and she found this. This is a statue of her hermaphroditus. It's a marble copy of a fresco from Herculaneum uh, in ancient Greece. And this is the epitome of the image of beauty of the human figure in Greece. And then you notice breasts and male genitalia. They were very comfortable with this. This was not a problem for them. So you reach into the past and say, gee, the ancient Greeks were comfortable with this. Why can we use this to help parents now struggle with this, help school, schools have to deal with this, and then everybody else? So the fluidity of sex and gender. Sex is a biological category where we sort human beings by their reproductive role, and gender is the psychosocial uh, sense we make of that. And so when I was a senior in high school, I played this woman, Lady Macbeth, um, in a night of scenes from Shakespeare. So here's an adolescent man playing a woman, calling on the spirits to unsex her so she can become a cruel, heartless man and go murder King Duncan, right? As we know, it ended badly because the, the forest came to Dunsinane, Burnham Forest came to Dunsinane, and like in all Shakespeare tragedies, the stage is strewn with the bodies of the dead. So come you spirits, tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here. Right? Now there's a problem playing Lady Macbeth. If you do it, she never leaves you. So staring up at me right now from my hippocampus, right, my memory cells, is Lady Macbeth. So this is, this is high art, right? From the greatest you know, playwright in the history of the world, probably. And we, as we know, the original was in Klingon. <laughs> right? Just ask Mr. Worf, he'll tell you, right? So this, this is, and this is admired stuff. This is one of the great characters to play for a man or a woman. By the way, imagine a woman playing that part, which Shakespeare wouldn't have done. So it's a woman calling on the gods to make her into a nasty man. Um, so that, uh, and it's just beautifully written. I mean, it's just spectacular. So the fluidity 
of our sex and gender and the fluidity of our world in, gen in general is, I think, captured by this page paper. This is called The Turning Road at Lestock, painted in 1906 by one of the foes, Andre Durand. This hangs in the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, where I would go to restore my soul after dealing with difficult cases in the hospital. It is four feet by five feet, so it's, and it was restored about 10 years ago and is just spectacular. I used to docent uh, third graders back in the 90s at this museum, and I would ask them what colors are correct. And they had to struggle, right? And you realize some of the leaves are correct, but none of the trees are, right? So I'd say, well, is it possible for a tree to be orange? And they would look at me, say, and I would say, yes, it is. Use your imagination when you leave this building. Turn the trees orange. So even where we see, look around us, these, these great stable trees on these solid mountains, it's all fluid, highly fluid. And we've got to try uh, to make sense of that. And I want to close with one of my friends at the Clark. This is Givernay uh, in the spring. When we were there on Tuesday, a wonderful docent was asking the, the, these less than like six or seven year olds, how do you know it's spring? So ladies and gentlemen, how do you know it's spring? The leaves are green and budding. What's on the ground? What color? What's the, what's the white? Flowers, flowers. Now look to the right. What color are those tree trunks? Purple and blue. He beat Durant, right? By 36, by, by what, 19, 1890, so 16 years. So Monet was a secret fove, right? <laughs> Lane Faison didn't teach us that, right? But what I've always thought of is the middle tree is a self-portrait. Um, I'm convinced that a lot of painters do self-portraits when they paint trees. Um, is Spike here? Where's Spike Riley? When we went through the Clark together in our 25th reunion, I made this point, and Spike said that I was spewing fertilizer. Um, <laughs> and I corrected him. I said, in Texan, it's called bovine extirpation. Uh, Got to look that up in your dictionaries. But you can use it in polite company. So this painting, when, we, when I first met it, and many of you did that fall of 1965, was then 75 years old. The students who come here in the fall will meet a painting that's 125 years old, and it looks like it was painted yesterday. So if you haven't been out to the Clark, go see this. It's in the main room. By the way, the Clark is wonderful. It's a temple, remember? And used to come up those stairs, and in the center of the temple is where the great goddess of Athena Nike, the defender of Greece, should be, as she was in the Parthenon. And who used to be there? Dagon's little dancer, protecting us from harm. Now she's in her own little side chapel, right? The, the, the architect redesigned the temple, created these little side chapels, and the little dancer is in there all by herself with these wonderful deep purp wine purple uh, walls around her. So connect to the past is what I try to do to make sense of what I'm experiencing as a medical educator or in my life in general. And I think I'm not alone in saying I learned to do that here, although it took me a while to figure out that I learned to do that here. And I'll close just with one thing. I remember clearly Dean Hyde during a freshman day saying, the purpose of your being here is to take possession of your own minds. But don't, whatever you do, tell your parents that's what you're doing. That was great, Larry. That was really good. Uh, and um, not all the perfumes of Araby will wash your little hands, as I recall. That's what, uh, that's what Lady Macbeth said. Anyway, um, so Bob uh, obeyed the rules and read the books back uh, in uh, 1965. Um, but he doesn't obey the rules anymore because he asked both Larry and I to submit three sentences about ourselves so that he could read those to introduce us, but he didn't read the, the three that I'd written. And so I will <laughs> recite them myself. <laughs> and uh, I think what I said was something along the lines of that my father, uh, Connie Constantine, uh, who played in the NFL, and uh, was a World War II hero and flew, uh, actually flew on, on D-Day. 
um, but he was doing air cover. He was a, a waste gunner and a bombardier at a B-24 Liberator bomber. Um, uh, died uh, spring weekend, our freshman year, May 14th, 1966. And uh, I, I, I neither played in the NFL nor was a war hero. And so it was very hard for me to think of myself as ever uh, living a longer life than, than my dad, who died at the age of 59. So I am both very surprised <laughs> and very happy to be here today. Um, so I don't know whether you guys have read the, uh, the In Our Own Words bios, but uh, anyone here who might have read mine, which was a real chest-thumping bio, um, We'll have learned that in terms of public speaking, I've, I have really been around the pool a few times, to, to quote Joan Didion. Uh, I have argued in the US Supreme Court. I have testified before Congress maybe around 30 times, including at uh, Supreme Court nominations. I have done just about every kind of speech or lecture or teaching in just about every sort of place, small rooms and large, et cetera. But uh, I've never felt the weight that I feel today in attempting to fulfill this particular assignment. And that weight got much, much heavier when I saw Larry McCullough's slideshow, which he sent a few weeks ago, full of uh, deep thoughts, erudition, and uh, beautiful images of intersex and hermaphrodites. That, that, that just added the weight on top of me. Now, reading the books uh, assigned to us for freshman orientation, uh, The Image by Kenneth Boulding and Science and Human Values by Bernowski, and in fact, for me, reading them for the first time, since I did not obey the rules back in 1965, and I remember hiding that night, uh, it made me happy that with Boulding, I hadn't mitch, missed very much in the intended first time around. Um, uh, Bernowski, I think, is, is is quite the opposite. I think Bernowski is brilliant. If you didn't read it then or now, uh, I recommend it to all of you. But my answer to why the image uh, was assigned to us in 1965 is tentative. Uh, perhaps it was assigned to intimidate us. Perhaps uh, to introduce deuce us to bad pedantry, and I realize that's a bit redundant. I recall that one book in Political Science uh, 101 was assigned for that reason, or so Professor Greg, Craig Brown told us. He said, we assigned this book to introduce you to bad stuff, and so that you could discern uh, bad stuff when you got it. But possibly, and more likely, because someone thought that the image really provided a foundation and framework for thinking about how humans perceive their world, themselves, how those images change, and how those changing images affect human behavior. Reading the image now and more profitably, and this is what I really did in preparation, reading all 113 of your bios at least twice each, you know, some more than twice, and one 10 times. It was 10 times when I, when I wrote this. It's now 12 times, this particular bio. My comments on Boulding's image will be concise. In my estimation, it is either much ado about nothing, or as my Perry housemate uh, of blessed memory, Carl Castleman, uh, said of a certain political science course, he said that that course was Fred Schumann restating the obvious. Uh, uh, I think that this book, the image, is uh, Kenneth Boulding restating the obvious. So given that, I want to talk about a different image, right? The image I want to talk to you about is the image that emerges from your 113 uh, bios. It's the image of ourselves. It's the image of this country. It's the image of the planet as we approach the end of our lives. I know that's a downer, but hey. That is what powerfully emerges, and I didn't write these, you wrote them, right? So that's what powerfully emerges from reading and rereading the bios. The image that seems most important to us is the one that will occur at the last moment. 
One classmate wrote in his bio, quote, who knows where this path will wind up. Another classmate wrote, I know my final graduation from life will be the greatest miracle of all. And while those expressions are very spiritual, specific, and poetic, the vast majority of the bios reflect an awareness and deep concern about the final image. And I don't believe that's just because we're all 72 or so and have all lost loved ones and have all been frequently reminded by friends uh, in the Williams Development Office to remember the college in our last wills and testaments. Uh, I just came from a breakfast where that reminder was uh, expressed uh, 17 different times. <laughs> We've been preparing and being schooled for the final moment from the earliest days of our lives. Williams was teaching us about the importance of the final moment and the final image when we still were teenagers in the mid-1960s. And in fact, we were being told about it and its importance well, well before that. In one of my Williams classes, Professor Charlie Samuels assigned Hemingway's The Short, Happy Life of Francis Macomber. That's a brilliant story about a man who finds his courage, strength, and self-esteem in the last few seconds of his life in the presence of his unfaithful wife and a lion. Hemingway's and Samuel's point was that though Macomber's life was brief, it was good and it was fulfilled despite its brevity and despite its violent end because it came at the culmination. And that culmination was the end of one phase and it was possibly preceded by some other phase perhaps eternity. Both Samuels and Hemingway decided when their final moments would be. I think you know that. Each decided when he would die. Well before Williams College, I went to a public elementary school in Queens, New York, where an old-fashioned principal, a guy named David Caro, required all students, everybody, from third grade up to memorize and be ready to recite with feeling and gestures, you know, to old fashioned, to recite many famous American speeches and poems. His favorite speech, and it was mine too, was one by Daniel Webster, and it included the following passage. When my eyes shall be turned to behold for the last time the sun in heaven, may they not see them shining on the broken and dishonored fragments of a once glorious union on states dissevered, discordant, belligerent, on a land rent with civil feud or drenched as it may be in fraternal blood. I was taught about that final moment and that possibly tragic last image in third grade at PS 164 <laughs> and taught that it was my duty as an American to help make my final image of America unlike the one that Webster feared and that he only escaped because he died nine years before the, uh, before the Civil War began. Emerging from the class of 1969 bios is fear of a final image of the United States, not unlike the one Webster warned against and worked to prevent. It's, it's, it's throughout your bios. And one, the living members of William 69 have an opportunity to help discard and replace with a better one. That's a lot of the theme that we heard yesterday in those 11 wonderful uh, talks that were given by, uh, by our friends. The state of the nation, the planet, its people and environment as we approach the end is a common and constant theme in many and most of our bios. But it's not the only commonality, and it's not even the dominant one from my reading. Allow me to report some of the other common threads in the bios before relating these to the final image and its brooding omnipresence. 
It's not surprising, and I wasn't surprised, that at the center of most of class of 69 self-images, by the way, after, we have to start to say class of 1969 because, <laughs> yeah, you're right, right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> because it's, a, it's getting ambiguous, right? Um, so it's not surprising that the uh, center of most of class of 1969 self-images <clears throat> are a spouse, partner, and with most, but not all, children and grandchildren. I was blown away by the typical length and duration of these unions. Many of the marriages are currently more than 30 years and counting. Even more are in their early, mid, or late 40s, and there are nearly as many 50s as 30s still going. In the 20th and early 21st century America, this is atypical and extraordinary. And I'm expressing no value judgment that this is fantastic or good or bad. I'm just, I'm a reporter here. Uh, so no value judgment on that fact. But many classmates did, and many who have divorced almost uniformly describe those breakups not merely as transitions, but as defeats and failures, and even some assign partial blame to attending all male Williams. Most of the divorced report eagerly marrying again and again <laughs> and again. Another common thread is thoughts about the war. What war? The war, the Vietnam War, and what we did in relation to it. 50 years later, give or take a few, the war is still fresh and raw in our minds as the number assigned to our birth dates in the Selective Service Lottery held on December 1st, 1969. I don't know if you read these things, but everybody remembers that. Everybody remembers the number that they were assigned. Some in our class served in that war. Many, many more avoided service, and some of those regret having done that. But the bios are devoid of a single endorsement of the war. And the war, its justifications, and the subsequent revelations about those justifications continue to shape our image of the United States and its role in the world 50 years later as we prepare to depart. In the class of 1969, the number and proportion of doctors, lawyers, educators, journalists, architects, orthodontists, technical writers, scientists, authors, poets, performing artists, athletes, craftsmen, restaurateurs, business executives, civil servants, entrepreneurs, ministers, missionaries, and Zen priests is pretty standard for a highly selective school, as is the fairly standard circuitous path we've traveled before landing in a primary vocation. Everybody who's, who, who points out that they got to be a doctor by starting out uh, to try to run a restaurant and vice versa, seems to think that that is so surprising, but that's, that's the standard, okay? And that, I think, is a standard due to Williams, frankly, okay? Only a few outliers seem to have known exactly what they wanted to do and did it, and only one described his path as linear. On a personal note, for many years, the dean at my law school had me do an annual session with 1Ls, first-year students, titled, a non-linear career, as mine has been. But that was, that was pretty standard for us. The class's standard career choices, compromises, and defaults have been practiced at an extraordinarily high level of skill and achievement. I was really proud lis listening yesterday to, to our friends. Uh, and I, and Jan and I, Jan's here, have, have regularly, regularly dined at Yogi's Dutch Barn for 15 years, so I can personally attest to some of this high level of achievement and excellence. And regardless the field of, of endeavor, a common thread emerges. The class worked while constantly continuing to learn and constantly teaching others. For this lifelong commitment to learning and teaching, many classmates credit Williams, but more specifically, Gaudino, Gates, Winston, Schumann, Van Auerkirk, Shaneman, Barrows, 
Faison, Winston, Bolton, Hege, Chandler, Burns, Rudolph, Stoddard, Green, Graver, Marcus, Warren, Compton, Hunt, Dean Hyde, and President Sawyer, and others. If there is a feature of the image that can be said to be uniform, it seems this desire, love, responsibility to learn and teach is that feature. My reading of the worldview of this class has this continuous education process at its core. Bob Dylan, our generation's poet, right? we, we knew it, right? we knew he was a poet, who was recognized a few years ago by the others at the Nobel Foundation as the world's poet laureate as well said, I'll let you be in my dream if I can be in yours. Just let's just stop for a second and think about it. Like when he won that Nobel Prize, right? And he didn't show up because he was, you know, sort of from our generation. But when he won that Nobel, didn't you feel like you were being awarded that prize? I did. I, 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 did. I felt like it was a, a prize to us, you know? You know? Um, and there's something in, uh, in Bronowski about that, which I'll read to you, which is just brilliant. The poem or the discovery exists in two moments of vision, the moments of appreciation as much as that of the creation. For the appreciator must see the movement, wake to the echo which was started in the creation of the work. We reenact the creative act and we ourselves make the discovery again. And I, when he won the prize, I hadn't yet read Bernowski. <laughs> but, yeah, now I understand what, you know, what he was, uh, you know, why I felt like I was getting that award that day with Dylan. Anyway, so, let, yeah, I'll let you be in my dream if I can be in yours. Let's shift that from Dylan's dream to our final images. I won't ask anybody here what you might wish for that to be, but I will tell you something about the expected contours of mine. Nine years ago, in 2010, I experienced the last days of two beautiful young friends, both 46 years old, a man and a woman. The woman was named Erin Keith Martin. I always like to say names. It's a Jewish tradition. You name people. You say their names. Her name was Erin Keith Martin. And the other was, the, the guy was a member of the class of 1986 of Williams. Derek Stephen Tillman Van Pantaleon Van Eck. Derek Van Eck, 19, class of 1986. Both of these people absolutely knew the end was imminent. Both were unafraid. Both focused on nothing but the love they had made and taken in their lives, to paraphrase uh, the other poets of the 1960s, our other poets. Both had achieved a lot in their work, but there was little consideration of any of that, or at least nothing expressed about it, nor anything about the president, or the country, or global warming. Those good fights had been fought and were not the focus of their attention. These two focused on the love in their lives. They were happy, and, they, look, and they, were, they were in pain, but they were happy, and they looked forward to the future. The last thing each said to me was an expression of affection and a confident promise to see me and everyone else surrounding them again. From those moments with my friends and forward, my understanding has been that my education at Williams and at all those other places like PS 164, my and all of our continuing educations, all the stuff that we got from Gates and, you know, and Schumann and Burns and Van Arakirk, you know, and Samuels and, and, and everybody else, all that we've got from our loves, from our parents, from our children, all the stuff that one of our classmates apparently got from loving and being loved by a dying prison inmate that he has supported for 40 years. All of that was preparation for the most important moment and image in our lives. So that's what I learned from rereading our 1965 summer books. Thanks.
Thank you, Larry, and thank you, Lloyd. I'm more than welcome to hear comments from people in the audience. If you have some thoughts you'd like to share, please do, and we'll have a little bit of a conversation. John. I guess I'd like to defend the image. <laughs> I'm ready for the, for the uh, I'm ready to attack. I think I think I read the image. I'm a freshman here. And uh, if I were not the image, I never would have gotten my first job as a research assistant for Kenneth Bolton. <laughs> At the University of Colorado. Uh, and he was extremely impressed that I had read the image. <laughs> I don't remember it. <laughs> but he told me, he said, you know, uh, that was my uh, intellectual orgasm. He said, I wrote it in six days. He dictated. Uh, Kenneth Boley stuttered. He had an amazing stutter. But he loved to give public speeches. And he literally kept you on the back of your seat when he was talking. And I do remember uh, when I was, I, I worked on my PhD in economics, which I didn't study in Williams. I was a history major. I had a B in economics at Williams. So I had a little makeup work to do to, to get a PhD in it. Um, but I remember that he would, he would stutter and he always find a different word. I said, so Dr. Golding, when do you think I'll finish this dissertation? And he said, probably in September. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, he was a brilliant economist, a uh, behavioral scientist. He changed from his economics text, predated Samuelson. Uh, and it was the core text that was used around the world. He never got a PhD. He was from Liverpool. Uh, he was a Nobel Prize winning economist and uh, he, he became a behavioral scientist. It was a wonderful, wonderful human being and the image did get me that first job. <laughs> I was working. Anyway, I, I anticipated uh, something like that, so I prepared uh, a quote to read a quote from. <laughs> so, uh, so this is from page 60 of the image. Um, uh, it is true, of course, that the image of the role to some extent imposes itself on the individual op occupying the role. When a man becomes the president of the United States, he begins to behave like a president of the United States. <laughs> Whatever his previous character and behavior. Um, so. Uh, in addition to all, all the other brilliance of Bolding, he was also incredibly prescient. Um, <laughs> but, but, your, but your comment reminds me of something, and I think you know, part of this weekend is, is, uh, is an adaptation of what, we, what, what people in the Klan call Jewish geography, but this is William's geography. So when you mentioned his stutter, uh, many of us had the, the, you know, the great fortune to, to to study under the real Bill Gates, right? <laughs> the original Bill Gates, and uh, who was just an unbelievably wonderful professor, economics professor, had been on the Council of Economic Advisors to the President, et cetera, and had a huge stutter. And the best thing about that stutter is that the stutter got more and more pronounced as the whatever he was about to say became more important. So when the stutter got incredibly pronounced, you knew <laughs> to take the notes. And it was, I mean, uh, I've never, I've, I've never uh, been present to anybody who was a better lecturer than, than Bill Gates with, with his stutter. Anyway. Thank you. Are there other comments, please? Just one, and to follow up on that, part of what I always experienced from that was that insight was not always the result of a ponderous um, and meditative process, but rather the exaltation of an inspiration. 
And Bill would just get, all of a sudden, he would, something would flash, and I could almost see that there were multiple screens going, firing off in his head at the same time, and he couldn't figure out which one to express. But they were all different versions of the same idea that had come. He just had never thought of it that way, and he was about to share this new thing with us. So it, it was never a lecture of something that he'd just done a hundred times. It was always absolutely in the moment. And, and that was such, that was refreshing, as opposed to whatever that dismissive comment was made about Red Fred. <coughs> Tom. Uh, you mentioned the massacre of one car, which is seared into my memory. <laughs> <laughs> and when I came back here after being away for 10 years in 1979, um, I went up to, and, and by that time I was an educator, had a degree in education and other things, so and had taught for nine years. And, um, and one of the first questions I asked John High, who was a colleague, was, you know, what was going on when you assigned that? Because you gave us that packet of paper, we went back to say Jeff, and were collectively scratching our head, <laughs> having no idea what to do, what to memorize, what we did, <laughs> the consequences of what we were going to do how we were going to be evaluated. And I just said to John, did you know what you're doing? By this I mean not John I himself, but the history department at Williams College collectively. As we heard yesterday, that the curriculum was slightly more coherent then than it is now. And John just smiled very gently and just said, of course. Um, <laughs> we, were, we were awakening you. Uh, we expected you to be plummets as, as you were. We expected you to go back and chat with one another, and we were welcoming you to a new world. So some of the things that I thought of as random were, were deeply intentional intellectually. Uh, they knew what they were doing when they, when they did that, and I know that they knew what they were doing when they assigned those two books to us, which was a kind of shock and awe that um, <laughs> you're, you're in a new world, son, and you better adapt pretty quickly or you're not going to do very well. So anyway. Thank you, Tom. Sir, uh, I was uh, in the uh, class of 54, and we had an amazing professor in philosophy, Professor Miller. And uh, one class was particularly impressive. We waited for an hour, and he arrived. And he left Stetson Hall, and cogito ergo sum. He says, I wandered off thinking and showed up. And uh, the epistemological golf parents went out and he, he couldn't publish anything because he was so well respected. He didn't want the Harvard people to come in and parse his sentence. But, but he was an amazing, amazing, he was an amazing professor. <coughs> who uh, spurred all these sciences in the notes here for. Wonderful. Thank you. Are there any other? Yes. Hi, Bob. Hey. Uh, I was struck in listening to this uh, discussion and the discussions of yesterday were uh, how many of us came to Williams and then uh, with self-doubt and, uh, and struggled in those early years. I, two, two things came to mind for me. One is that we probably, most of us, came after having succeeded well in high school. And the challenges of these books, the challenges of those assignments, broke us down. Broke down the confidence that they then rebuilt. That's something that happens in many um, things like military academies and all of that. The other part that it does is it brings you together. You've all gone through it. You've shared some of these uh, challenges and, uh, and, and uh, uh, come together as a group and as a unit. And Larry, in your discussions of, of uh, uh, Bolding and Bronowski and how they, they approached humanities in one and, and the sciences in another and how they knit those together, the part that we didn't realize, and maybe should have been as explicit, was that the way you create change is through relationships, and who you can call on, and who can advise you, and who can help uh, you succeed. 
and we were having our relationships built up here as we uh, got through Williams, and I hope many have continued to see that as one of the, the levers for change as we've gone forward into the, the world. Thank you. Any comments on that? Well, I want to thank you on behalf of Larry and Lloyd and myself for joining us this morning. This is an important weekend for us, and we, we're in the midst of this weekend. So let this, this morning's session, along with yesterday's, spark many, many wonderful conversations. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Dave Lowe, who'd like to very talk about this afternoon. That was heady, thoughtful, very interesting stuff. Uh, it occurs to me in hindsight that the reading assignment would have made a lot simpler for me had I just arranged to have a, a short snack bar session with these three gentlemen. <laughs> those those uh, books down pat. On the other hand, I think I would have been very intimidated by how smart and uh, insightful you three are. So thank you very, very much for that great talk. Speaking of intimidation, what is one to do, or what are two to do as co-chairs of the reunion weekend when they learn that among our class are three uh, men of faith from very different backgrounds who somehow have the idea that they want to put together a different type of remembrance of, uh, event. My goodness, that's going to lead, no doubt, to confusion and disagreement, tension, perhaps. Not so when you have three souls like Chuck Hotchkiss and Johan Hinderley and Chris Dinell, who've been hard at work uh, for 12 months designing um, a, a means for us to honor our departed classmates and for us to hold dear uh, uh, our memories of time with them in the Purple Valley. Chris is going to take just a minute to, to preview that for those of us in 69 so we have a little bit of sense of what we hope to do after lunch. Thank you. Uh, I did spend a moment this morning down at the cemetery, um, which will be the concluding part of our walk. Um, I mention that because I never personally got to mark the end of my dad's life in terms of where he's buried. Um, I say that because I think the um, remembrance is kind of like a, a walk that will move us through time and space and relationship. Um, we can do this walk together. We can do this walk alone. We can do it in any fashion we choose. Um, there will be names read of those classmates of ours who have died going before us in death. Um, we would invite those of you who are reading the names to meet up with us around 1.15 at Horn Hall and there are still some remaining names of classmates who you might choose or want to uh, be the person to read their name when we're at Griffin. Um, once again, uh, this weekend is just opening, in us, opening us up, and this is another way of doing this together. So I hope you'll come along for our walk this afternoon. Thank you.